Okay, welcome back. Uh, this is Unit 10, Day 5. Uh, this unit will be discussing about adverse weather conditions. Um, if you're living in North Carolina, you know one minute it could be sunny, one minute it could be snowing, one minute raining, next minute uh, cloudy, foggy. Uh, other parts of the country experience the same kind of weather things to weather conditions. So really all parts of the country are the same. Uh, we may experience more rain in North Carolina than Massachusetts, but they may experience more snow. Um, some, some areas may have more hurricanes and tornadoes and things, so forth and so on. So this is um, day five still, unit 10. Uh, we'll get with the videos and the PowerPoints. We'll wrap up today's lessons and then we'll uh, talk more about what to expect for day six. Thank you. Adverse weather conditions. Oh boy. As I mentioned, uh, every part of the country has their own specific uh, adverse conditions. Um, here in North Carolina, we don't get as much snow as up, up north. Uh, however, we get a lot more heat and stuff, uh, more rain probably. Anyway, so knowing uh, how to drive in all these circumstances will not only help you out, keep you safe, uh, it won't prevent you from um, uh, driving if you have a job or if you have to go somewhere or things like that you'll be more confident. <clears throat> Changing weather can, and conditions, visibility, uh, traction, change of traction conditions, emergency recovery, consequences of a crash, vehicle malfunction, reporting and collision. Nighttime driving is dangerous in, to itself. Um, as you can see on the one to the right, it's hard to tell how many headlights uh, that you actually have, how many sets of headlights that are kind of in your way. High beams um, used when safe and legal. Uh, you'll hear the term, and you probably have heard the term, outrunning your headlights or overdriving your headlights, meaning. Uh, you're going faster than the light can shine. Uh, speed, roughly, say speed for that. Speed 5, 60 for high beams. And if you were going 70, you may be outrunning them, depending on the quality of your headlights. Low beams, that's what usually most people have on. Uh, use that in bad weather, following someone or meeting an oncoming car at night safe speed there again not to outrun your headlights about 40 45 50 roughly um that, that way you, you can see as as you're driving adjust speed when you reach the headlights keep your eyes active moving if um, you pass an oncoming car it's okay to flash your lights once to let them know they have their high beams on if they do not for some reason out of spite or just forget or they don't know how or for whatever reason I always tell students to look at the right edge of the road and don't look directly into the headlights and then that way once you're, you're keeping your head straight you're looking straight ahead once the car passes then you can continue on looking at the middle of the road like you're supposed to Visibility limited by rain and snow. Try to keep your headlights clean. Uh, clear your windshield, wipe uh, windshield and rear, rear windows. Uh, sometimes you have to turn the defroster on to remove ice or condensation, depending on what the case may be. Reduce speed. Uh, turn your low beams on. Turn your windshield wipers on. In most states, including North Carolina, if you're 
windshield wipers come on, your headlights have to come on. Uh, that's the state law, actually. Here in North Carolina, I would imagine a lot of states are that way. Be alert uh, for vehicles stopped on the roadway. Uh, sometimes you get a big wind gust. Or, uh, make action smoothly and gently, or gently and smoothly. Okay. Don't be abrupt and don't try not to manhandle the car. Do something smooth. Sources of glare, obviously other headlights, dashboard, uh, papers and dashboard. Uh, you don't see that as often as you do did like in the 80s, 90s. Uh, snow covered landscape, you know, the sun's uh, shining off the snow, makes it glare possible. Uh, sometimes when you're driving at, at dawn or dusk, depending on where, what part of the day or where you're at, the sun could cause a major glare. So I would recommend wearing sunglasses. Countermeasures, as I mentioned earlier, look to the right edge of the road. If it's a car, oncoming headlights too bright or sun glare or something like that. Uh, don't put anything in the dashboard. Wear your sunglasses. Adjust your visors and, and mirrors. Fog. Um, reduce speed. Turn your low beams on, not your high beams. Uh, to be honest with you, that's my biggest heartache, like a better wording, is I want to turn my headlights on bright in a fog. And that's really the worst thing you can do. Turn your windshield wipers on. Turn your defroster on or air, depending on, to get the condensation off your windshield. The reason you don't want your high beams on is the high beams will reflect off the water molecules in the air from the fog and bounce back in your face. And it's very, very scary. And you're limited. Visibility is very, very limited. Heavy fog, reduce speed ahead. Turn your flashers on. And to be honest with you, if it's pretty foggy, I'd turn my flashers on anyway. Look to exit from the highway. Uh, even though it'll be the same amount of fog, if you can, um, it's lower speed. It's like if you would get off on the interstate into just a regular road, maybe that regular road's 45 miles an hour versus the interstate was 55, 60 miles an hour. Um, you know, you could easily have a, a serious accident in the fog at 40, uh, 55 miles an hour versus 40 or whatever speeds are. Strong winds, like uh, you know, we do have like in September in North Carolina, we have hurricane season. Uh, we get a large, sometimes we get hurricanes um, those uh, obviously bring a lot of wind and rain, so you want to reduce speed to make sure you got good grip of the hand of the steering wheel. Always check for oncoming traffic. Adjust your lane position. Don't ever steer. Be prepared to counter steer. And keep your foot off the brake. You're fine. Uh, this is the video. ABS brakes. Uh, just basically the. ABS brakes are computerized brakes to where they pump the brake for you. We've learned about crumple zones already in previous videos and different types of technology. Slippery conditions. Um, reduce, reduce speed. Sometimes curves are, are sli uh, slippery. Roads can be slippery. Most dangerous is when temperature is near freezing. And that brings me up to my next point with temperature and freezing. A lot of times here in North Carolina in particular, they will let school out early uh, to prevent, you know, if we're having a bad snowstorm. And that's all good. But when you're driving home from school, just keep in mind most likely, most likely, the temperature is hovering around freezing, maybe 
a degree or two below, a degree or two above. It, road conditions still could be slick. Let's say the temperature is 33. You still may have some black ice conditions, uh, ice conditions. Maybe there's a bridge or maybe there's a, a, a road that's heavily, you know, got a lot of trees on it. And maybe that temperature is a lot lower already. Maybe there's a bridge. So when you're getting out of school due to freezing rain or snow conditions, just keep in mind the road still could probably give you some trouble. Uh, especially if they were slick or you know, have some black ice. After a rain on a hot day, uh, the steam from the asphalt and stuff could cause you some problems with slick and being able to see well. Heavily traveled intersections when it's raining. Okay. You know, as I mentioned in previous videos, any intersection is dangerous. Loss of traction. Uh, we haven't really talked about hydroplaning much. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that as we go. Reduce speed, increase space. Uh, don't be so impatient. Make speed changes gradually. Avoid abrupt changes in direction. You know, if you're going to turn left and we need to turn around, do it slowly, do it carefully. Don't just jerk the wheel and expect the tires to stay on the road. Also, to find the best path. Okay? In this photo you see straight in front of us, uh, you can see where the tra uh, tracks are already made. Stay in them. Uh, you got the best chance of uh, some traction for your car and things of that nature. So use the tracks that are already or path that are already that's already made for you. Causes of uh, traction loss: uh, road surfaces, obviously. Condition of vehicle: maybe you got balding tires. Uh, maybe you have in. Uh, underinflated tires. Actions of the driver. Maybe you hit the brake too hard or return too quickly, like I said in the previous slide. Signs of hot hydroplaning. Standing water. You hear a slushing sound when you go over. Sensation of steering wheel you know, loose or disconnected. And here's the main clue, the bottom one. If the car in front of you is not leaving a track. If it is leaving a track, they'll try to drive in that track, just like you saw in the snow. But if it's if it's not leaving any tracks whatsoever, conditions are right for hydroplaning. Okay? It doesn't take maybe half an inch of standing water for your car to hydroplane. Okay? So it doesn't take a major uh, rainstorm to for a car to hydroplane. Preventing hydroplaning. Okay, slow down when you see standing water. Increase your falling distance. Have your tires properly inflated. Driving the tracks of the vehicle left ahead of you. That's what I just said. Skidding. Uh, the video will show you better how how to prevent skidding. Uh, what causes it? Slippery surfaces. Uh, you're accelerating too hard. Braking too hard. Steering too much or too quickly. Or entering a turn too fast or a curve too fast. Preventing them. Apply brakes smoothly and gently. Make smooth, precise movements at the wheel. Remember what we talked about one thing at a time. And do it smoothly and gently, or gently and smoothly. Slow down well in advance before you go to the curve. Before you get to the curve. Maintain the speed appropriate for conditions. Obviously, if it's a snowstorm like what we see in this photo, and that road's 45 miles an hour, uh, chances are probably safe conditions are 25. So don't be so worried about speed limit, worried about how, how it affects you in your driving, how it's going to be safe 
for you to get to point A to point B. It may take some extra time. I'm going to skip through this. The videos show you a little bit better. And also, too, um, there is a one little video that talks about runoff road crashes and how to avoid them and what to do. Just keep in mind if you ever run off the road, I know this is easier said than done, but just keep in mind that you have to remain calm. You cannot panic. Panic will be the worst thing you can do, okay? So you have to remain calm and things of that nature uh, while you're uh, running off the road. The video will show you, the video clips will show you what to do and how to, how to do it without uh, too much trouble, hopefully. Uh, some of the off-road uh, crashes, inattentive, dr distraction, drowsiness, steers on the shoulder to avoid a collision, sometimes that happens. Sometimes somebody pulls out in front of you and the only place you got is to go off the road. Uh, vehicle may collide in another vehicle in the next lane or drive off the far side of the road. Off-road recovery, that's very important. First of all, as I mentioned earlier, remain calm. Once again, remain calm. Okay. Keep a good grip of the steering wheel. Slow down. He's about to accelerate. Straddle the edge. You see how the car's half on the pavement, half off. If you can straddle it, that's your best bet. Steer back onto the road when safe. In other words, you'll slow down a lot. And then if there's no traffic, then kind of ease back onto the road. Steer back onto the road. Return. Turn the two wheels at a time. Obviously, you're straddling, you got two wheels, and then you, as you're turning, you get two more. And stay in the lane. Evasive maneuvers, we'll t show you in the video more. Uh, there's space to the side. Stopping distance is question. Car is too close behind you. And once again, I'm going to let the video show you more. Controlling consequences. Of avoid a head-on collision. Okay. Drive off this road rather than skid off the road. And if you have to hit something, hit something softer. Hit something going the same direction will help. Okay. Hit a stationary object with a glance and blow. Okay. Hit a stationary object rather than an approaching option. Okay. These are some of the things you can try to control. So, obviously, you don't want to be in any collision. But if there's something you can get softer to make, make the accident not quite as, as bad, uh, you might prevent injury or uh, property damage. Well, by all means, try to do so. Symbols and warning symbols on your dashboard. Everyone has different symbols. These are pretty much standard. Blowout, tire blowout, grip the firm, uh, grip the wheel. Grip the wheel firmly. Take your foot off the accelerator. Do not brake. Allow the car to slow down. Check your traffic. Turn your flashers on if you can. Drive to a protected area. Drive to an area that you can maybe change your tire and stuff. Or at least get the car off the road where you can prevent other accidents. Accelerator to failure. Shift to neutral. Try to find an escape route or a path. Steer smoothly and gently. Pull off the road. Turn the car off. And of course repair the problem if you can or Call a tow truck. Brake failure, pump brakes rapidly, shift to lower gear, 
that slows the car down. Uh, apply your parking brake and find the soft crash area. Engine failure, shift to neutral, look for escape path. Do not brake hard, pull off the road. Try to restart your car if you can. If unsuccessful, raise your hood and turn your flashers on. If you're overheating, your engine overheats, turn off the AC, turn the heater on, pull off the road, turn the engine off, do not open the radiator. A lot of people do that and of course seek help. A lot of people do that. Keep in mind the radiator is really hot. It's got liquid in it, whether it's water or antifreeze. And it's due to the cap being screwed on tightly. Um, you have a lot of pressure built up in the radiator. At the moment it has some uh, tension released. Uh, you could potentially have a problem with the radiator uh, cap blowing up or like a rocket and hot uh, liquid, whether it's water or uh, antifreeze, spewing out at the time, which could cause a huge problem. Handling crashes, we'll talk a little bit about that. Reporting collisions, uh, we'll talk about collisions. Stop immediately. Remember, aid the injured. Okay. Remember, North Carolina has the Good Samaritan Law. So if you hurt somebody by you trying to help by mistake, don't worry about it. Pro try to prevent further damage. Send for the police. Exchange information and reporting. Uh, record witness names. And then, of course, notify any church. And we'll go a little deeper into a couple of things, too, while we're talking. Getting back to, well, let's, let's do the video first. seen that car and been prepared in case it pulled out. We simply don't see as well when there's no sun to light things up for us. The only light we can count on comes from these. But to do the job, they need to be clean. Dirt on the lens can reduce light by as much as 90%. Now you see it. Now you don't. And both lights need to be working. Look at the difference between two lights and one. It's worth checking. If we're parked behind a car or in front of a garage door, we can use the reflection to see if both lights are working. Both are. But here, one isn't. We can also check for high and low beams. Both are okay. Now it's a matter of using them correctly. The first thing is, of course, to turn them on. The law requires turning them on by sunset. Actually, there's no law against turning them on whenever it's hard to see or be seen. At night, we sure need them for both. In fact, on a dark road like this, we need all the light we can get. High beams let us see about 250 feet ahead, more than twice as far as we can see with low beams. 
enough distance to slow down and steer around that box. Sure, we have to dim them from time to time, but it's worth the effort to be able to spot problems while there's time to do something about them. Not here, though. On a well-lighted city street, we can see well enough with low beams. We don't need to keep raising and lowering beams. Sometimes high beams aren't enough. Could we stop in time to avoid running into this car? Remember the sight distance rule? It said that we have to be able to stop in the distance that we can see. Let's use that parked car we saw back there and try the four second rule. Get ready. 1001, 1002, 1003, 1. We were going too fast to have stopped. This is called overdriving the headlights. If we drive any faster than 45 miles an hour, we're overdriving the headlights of most cars. Limited night visibility affects space as well as speed. First, with only taillights to go by, it's a little more difficult to tell how far back we are and how fast we're overtaking. Also, not being able to see beyond the headlights makes it difficult to anticipate when the car ahead may have to stop suddenly. That means we need to leave more space than we would in the daytime. This one's about analog brakes. It's important that you know if the vehicle you're driving is equipped with anti-lock brakes. On vehicles with ABS, you'll see this symbol light up on your instrument panel when you start the engine. Here are the ABS rules. Stop. Firmly depress the brake pedal. Stay on the brakes. Don't pump the brakes. Steer where you want to go. The noise you hear and the pedal vibration you feel are normal. That means that the ABS is working. Remember that anti-lock brakes, as good as they are, can't overcome the laws of physics. Just because your vehicle has ABS doesn't give you a license to drive more aggressively. Always keep a safe distance in front of you and maintain a speed consistent with road conditions. And always, always wear your safety belt. Most 
skids come from braking too hard, usually on a slippery surface. Sometimes it happens because we try to turn too quickly. And it can happen when trying to accelerate too rapidly. Recovering from a skid requires a quick reaction. First, we get off the brake or accelerator. Next, we turn the wheel in the direction we want the car to go. This is a natural reaction. But to stop skidding in the wrong direction, we have to react quickly. Now we're turning back in the direction we want the car to go. But if we continue, we'll end up spinning in the other direction. So even before the car straightens out, we counter steer back the other way. And again, just before it straightens out, we turn back the other way. We may have to counter steer a few more times, but if we correct each time before the car reaches straight ahead, it will gradually straighten out. Whenever we're driving on a slippery surface, we must be prepared to react quickly at the first sign of a skid. First, stay off the brake and just concentrate on steering. Second, steer back in the direction we want to go. Third, get ready to counter steer to keep from spinning in the other direction. The best way to handle skids is to prevent them by avoiding slippery surfaces, adjusting speeds to conditions, and being gentle in use of the brake, accelerator, and steering wheel. We can't count on always getting out of trouble. Just knowing what to do may help, particularly if we run the steps through our minds frequently. Okay, this recovery is pretty important. If you could prevent pain, heartache, loss for yourself and others, you would. That's the thing about single car runoff road crashes. They're totally preventable. Of the collisions I have investigated, some of the reasons for a runoff the road crashes are driving too fast for conditions and simply not paying attention, especially in rural areas where we have sharp curves, steep drop-offs, and narrow shoulders, even very little room for error. While the installation of new safety features such as rumble strips and rumble stripes can help prevent runoff road crashes, ultimately, safety depends on you. Obey the speed limit and slow down. Driving too fast for conditions is a factor in half of all runoff road crashes. Driving at night increases the risk of being involved in runoff road collision. You have additional factors such as fatigue, limited visibility, and impaired driving. Late night is a peak time for run-off-the-road crashes. Be alert, awake, and alcohol and drug-free. If you're too sleepy to drive, don't. And always, always buckle up before you drive. Seat belts are the single best way to protect yourself and your passengers in a crash. First responders see firsthand what a difference a seatbelt can really make. To get in the car and take that simple act of buckling up can be the difference between walking away with a few bruises and never walking again. It really can make a difference. And if you do run off the road, learn the driving skills to maneuver back safely. The number one tip from America's best drivers, don't overreact. What you do behind the wheel in a split second can make a world of difference. The first thing to remember if you find yourself driving off the road is to stay calm. Overreacting is the worst thing you can do. If you run off the road, remain calm. Keep a firm grip on the steering wheel. Stay off the brake. Stay off the gas. And quickly check for traffic in the front and rear. If possible, reduce your speed by coasting down to 20 or 30 miles an hour. Align your off-road wheels with the road about 12 to 18 inches off the edge so that both tires are free of the pavement. We call this straddling. It keeps the tires from scrubbing the pavement and gives you more control. With small inputs, steer back onto the road. 
as soon as your front tires strike the road's edge, apply pressure to the steering wheel to keep your vehicle from crossing into oncoming traffic. If you can't drive back onto the road, drive as far off the edge as you can safely. Gradually come to a stop and call for help. Additional funding will bring more safety improvements like rumble strips that save lives. But as drivers, we need to do our part for our own safety and because others are counting on us. The painful losses that come with runoff road crashes can last a lifetime for you and the ones you love. These are losses you can prevent. Practice safe, defensive driving. Pay attention. Slow down. Wear a seatbelt every time. And talk to other drivers about safety. Remember the three R's of safety when it comes to rumble strips or rumble stripes. Recognize rumble strips and rumble stripes when you see them on the roadway. Be ready to react in a calm manner if you run off the road and encounter these safety devices. Stay off the gas and off the brake. Allow the rumble strip to help you recover safely. Developing the skill needed to carry off evasive maneuvers requires instruction and practice. But here in the classroom, we can get a jump on in-car instruction by learning the procedures for making quick stops and quick turns and deciding which to make when. We'll start with the maneuvers themselves. Here, there's enough room to stop, so let's do it. With anti-lock brakes, ABS, we just press down hard. ABS gets the most out of brakes. It applies them as fully as possible without locking them. The main thing is to have confidence in them and stay on the pedal. Some drivers let up on the pedal when they feel or hear the brakes thumping. With manual brakes, it takes a little more finesse. To stop quickly, we apply the brakes firmly. If the car starts to skid, we ease up a bit, then press down again. With a little practice, we can learn to get maximum braking without skidding. Braking is the safest maneuver, if there's enough room. But when there isn't, a quick turn is the only alternative. With our hands in the right position, we can quickly turn the wheel a half circle to the left, then a full circle to the right, and back to the middle. Let's see that in real time. Left, right, left, and away. With ABS, we can brake at the same time. This slows us down and makes the turn a little less tricky. With manual brakes, there's too big a chance of locking up the wheels and losing control, so it's best to stay off them until we finish the turn. We've seen how to turn quickly and how to stop quickly. In an emergency, we need to know how to decide quickly. When there's no one beside us, we're free to turn either direction. But we may not be so lucky. With the car beside us in the left lane, our options are reduced to stopping if there's room or swerving right. What about here? We're too close to stop and the right lane is occupied. So, no choice. What this time? Right. There's no choice here either. There's a choice here, but while we probably have room to stop, the car behind us may not.
One in ten teenagers will have a crash sometime in their first year of driving. Doing the things taught in this course will improve the odds that we're not among the 10%. But if there is a crash, we need to know how to deal with it, whether we're involved in it or whether we're just in a position to help. In the event of a crash, there are four things that need to be done. First, protect the scene. Second, call for help. Third, take care of any injured. And fourth, report the accident. The first and most important thing to do at a crash scene is to keep things from getting worse. If the cars can be moved, we need to get them off the road, out of the travel lane. We don't have the right to block traffic and possibly cause a second collision. Whether we can get off the road or not, we need to warn approaching drivers. It's the same things we do if we have some kind of a breakdown. Remember those? If we're stopping to help someone else, we move past them so we don't block the view of the scene or get in the way of emergency vehicles. Once the scene is protected, the next step is to get help. If someone is injured, call 911 as soon as possible. If we don't have a cell phone, we try to find someone who has. While help is on the way, it's our job to take care of any injured. We try to make them as comfortable as possible. We should see if there's a physician, emergency medical technician, nurse, or just someone trained in first aid available to help. We need to do our best to keep the injury from getting worse. That means moving the person no more than is necessary to avoid danger from traffic or fire if there's fuel leaking. The last step. If the crash is serious enough to cause injury or block traffic, the police need to be notified. If it's just a fender bender, the police don't have to be notified and may not come anyway. But always be sure to get the other driver's name, address, and telephone number, their driver's license number, and their vehicle tag number and insurance. I would add, if, you, if there's an accident um, and a bump up like what they're saying here, you know, if there's any witnesses or anything, get their, that information as well. Uh, this is valuable information to get uh, but another thing what I would do as well is I would everybody pretty much has cell phones uh, smartphones with cameras I would walk around just quietly nonchalantly and take a picture of the other person's car and their tag number as well even though you've got it handwritten there <coughs> excuse me I've had a student before tell me a story that uh, she and her mother was in a bump up and her mother and another lady, the, the driver, uh, exchanged this information that they're telling you to. And so when the mother of my student went to try to get up with the other driver to, uh, I guess, file a claim or whatever. Uh, the other driver denied the whole thing, said that she wasn't even there, and she didn't know how she got her tag number, and yeah, you know, she made excuses. Well, because there wasn't any proof, uh, the other lady got off scot-free without any problems or any penalties, while the other lady had to file it with her insurance to get the car fixed. So this way. If you go around to the back and get a tag, you have visual proof that the, that particular car is the one that was in the accident with you. Uh, that's just a pointer. You don't have to do it. It's not my law. It's just something that I've heard of, you know, previous students before, and it's a good idea. That way, you've got proof, uh, and actually. Your camera will uh, do a timestamp as well. So not only do you have visual proof, you have the actual timestamp too. Company. It's also a good idea to get the name and telephone number of any witnesses. One thing we should not do is to admit it was our fault. We're not qualified to say whose fault it was, and it could void our insurance. Just collect the facts 
and leave the rest to the insurance company. If the car is undrivable, get a tow truck. The police may be able to call one. We also have to fill out and send in an accident. Okay, let me add to that as well. Uh, over a period of time, I've been in a couple small bump ups and things like that. Uh, usually, i be honest with you, I have not had the opportunity to have the police call for a record of, for me. I've had to do it on my own. Uh, so what I would recommend doing, there's phone apps and stuff in your insurance companies. Uh, I know cell phone companies have roadside assistance and you know some other auto clubs have you know, those as well. And that's all great. And there's apps to download things. But not only that, that those, those will work real well and I've used those before. I would actually Google a tow truck company near where you live and put their actual phone number in your phone contacts. This way, if you're out in the country area and you can't get Wi-Fi, uh, there's a possibility you can make a phone call. And that would probably prevent you having to stay stuck for quite some time. Also, too, is talking about uh, report. Most of my accidents that I've ever had been in, the police do the report, and then they'll give you a you know, time frame, 24, 48, 72 hours, something like that, um, to where you could go pick up a copy of the report. Also, too, I'd make plenty of copies of that report. Maybe go to an office place and make a few copies. Meantime, while you're waiting on that report, I would contact my insurance, if, even if it wasn't your fault. And this way, your insurance company uh, knows to be expecting paperwork and, and kind of have a leg to stand on instead of just being bombarded with paperwork they didn't know there was an accident involved. So I would, you know, make plenty of copies for yourself, for your, you know, insurance company, their insurance company, put, put one up for you. Uh, also too, I would tell my insurance company regardless, and that way they would be expecting paperwork. Could it report within a certain number of days if the damage was over a certain amount? We can get a copy of the form from the police or the motor vehicle department. However, our insurance company will generally send us one. Hopefully you learned something today, especially about how offer recovery and how important it is to stay calm and not try to manhandle the car uh, or truck or wherever you're in. Just remain calm, slow down, kind of straddle the, the road as best you can, and then ease back onto the road uh, when it's safe. And how to handle an accident. And, uh, once, like she said in the video, and if there's injuries, take care of the injury first, and then you know take care of the rest of the stuff second. Uh, keep in mind, North Carolina. If you're in North Carolina, you have the Good Samaritan Law, which if you you can try to help them the best you can. If you can't, you know you're not an EMT, you're not a medical, uh, you're just trying to help. Okay, so all that kind of plays in effect. Uh, uh, get help as soon as you can, 911. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, if you're in an accident and it's just a bump up and you don't call the police and that's your prerogative, um, make sure you walk around, take a little snapshot of the person's car 
they hit you or you hit them, whichever the case may be, that's in the accident with you. Uh, that way you have visual proof and timestamp where the car was at the time. So that, just like that story I told you earlier, uh, that won't happen to you, okay? Where somebody completely denies the fact that, that they were even there. Uh, the police reports, if uh, as I said, usually 24, 48 hours, 72 hours, something like that. Uh, they'll print it out, make plenty of copies. Uh, and that way you've got some for your personal cell. I mean, you may have to get an attorney involved, they, they'll want a copy. Uh, their insurance will want a copy, your insurance will want a copy. You know, a whole bunch of people may, may potentially want a copy. If you make plenty of copies, then that's just one less problem you have to worry about. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, also too, with tow trucks and things of that nature, uh, put it in your phone, you know, Google, you know, while you have a good signal, Google a towing company near your house, you put their uh, contact information, because sometimes you may be out where you don't have good Wi-Fi signal to use the apps and things of that nature, um, and then you, you could be stuck on the side of the road for quite some time, and you sure don't want that to happen, okay? All right, today's special code for this video, this is wrapping up day five. Uh, we just finished unit 10, okay, is EXP 1982, EXP 1982, and I look forward to tomorrow. Tomorrow, uh, we're going to wrap up the curriculum, we're going to do a couple of uh, videos, and then tomorrow you'll take your final, final exam. Hopefully you've studied, as long as you put forth a little effort as far as studying and knowing uh, the questions and answers you already give, been given in previous videos, okay, you really have no reason to do poorly, okay. Um, so I expect good grades from you guys, I'm looking forward to, you know, you guys that are paying customers that have signed up already, I look forward to getting behind the wheel with you and teaching you how to drive later on as soon as we can. Thank you.